digitaljamsessions.com. Hello and welcome to this Digital Jam session. Today we're joined by LSR from Rain Dance and the Digital Content Creators Network and Oliver returns to us from QWERTY Films. Welcome gentlemen. Hello. Hello there. Hi. Welcome back. Welcome back. So today we were going to talk about, oh sorry, actually no, I'm not going to see that everybody <laughs> knows who you are. I'm going to let you introduce yourselves even though if they are regular listeners they will know who you are but Alyssa, why don't, why don't you tell us exactly what you do with Rain Dance and with Digital Content Creators Network? I guess I have several hats. Uh, I'm an independent producer of features and online content and got involved in the rain, with Rain Dance to put together the Rain Dance Web Fest, which is the festival for celebrating the online side of filmmaking web series in specifically. And over the years of having made uh, online content and web content. I, I also set up Digital Creators UK, which is this uh, well as of as of all, just this past August is around five years old now, which is astonishing to think. Really, <laughs> how time um, flies when you're having fun. Indeed, yeah, and, and it's just really a, ne- a network of, of of creatives, of writers, producers, directors who who all really like making web series and online video, and really want to shine a bit more of a light and focus on what we're doing. Because whenever you read in an article, like you know, five web series you have to watch, inevitably the the journalist has just picked five popular American series mm. and kind of ignored. The fact that there's actually quite a burgeoning creative industry in the UK for for, for web series and, and, and online video. And really, it's just trying to say, hey, look, look at us, look what we're doing. And spreading the word by actually going to events like, you know, BVE, Expo, uh, VidFest, uh, MCM London Comic Con and YouTube Space and just talking uh, getting our creators out there and speaking and, and evangelizing about why other filmmakers should be making online, you know, uh, content for the web. Okay. And Oliver, you're, you're returning to us, but why don't you tell everybody exactly what you do over at QWERTY? Yes, I'm the head of production and development at QWERTY, so that means I've a number of hats, I suppose, but I'm uh, all under one umbrella. I work with the founder of the company, Michael Kuhn, on a slate of projects that we're developing, which are feature films and television series. A sort of editorial role, trying to get our projects from development into production and secure funding, um, and also bringing in responsible for bringing in new projects. And then when we are in production, I throw my weight into doing whatever I can to help those productions come in on time, on budget, and that kind of thing. Wonderful. And uh, just for reference for anybody who's not familiar with uh, QWERTY's slate, um, can you tell us a couple of the films that uh, QWERTY have released? Uh, sure. Uh, we've been going about 15 years. Uh, or the company has done films such as um, The Duchess, Stage Beauty, Severance, Sweet Frances, um, and we've just in post on our latest feature, which is the new Stephen Frears film about the world's worst soprano who sold out Carnegie Hall, stars Meryl Streep and Hugh Grant, and we're just editing that at the moment. Wonderful. Thank you very much, chaps. So yes, I wanted to speak today about this, and I'm not even going to call it a digital divide, but the the, the divide that exists between what some might consider as digital content creation and traditional filmmaking. Having both of you obviously very experienced in in either side of this particular fence, I'm curious to explore the middle ground, the grey middle ground in between, because I think we've spoken before about this, Oliver, but the the future of content creation does seem to to very much hinge on this this notion that uh, digital and and mobile content will become quite fundamental to the way that people consume entertainment going forwards. So I'm interested to hear from your development perspective, how much of your thought process is involved with digital content? Uh, I mean, well, increasingly, I mean, it, it very much depends on on what the project is. You know, if it's something like Florence, then uh, our latest feature, then, you know, any digital content that's sort of covered by the EPK, the electric electronic press kit is as you know suggested is a, is a promotional tool but uh, obviously you know in in the, the brave new world of netflix and amazon and Mubi and, and all those kinds of things increasingly you're looking at financing lower budget uh, feature films through an online distribution model mm. 
So when you talk about people like Netflix, and I think this is interesting from from your perspective, uh, Elsa, obviously we're talking about this content that is very much being homegrown, if you like, for for the internet and and for digital sharing. Do you think that there is a, a kind of a different suite, if you like, of materials that need to support this kind of digital content? It's not really that. I think it's also trying to change how creators, filmmakers think. You know, if you've been working in independent film in the UK, obviously there's a very prevailing opinion that when you're making a a film, you're making it for, you know, purely artistic reasons over any kind of sense of commerciality. And so it's something that I find when I'm trying to evangelise to filmmakers that they should be experimenting with web series and coming up with new ideas that they can trial out on the web is that, you have to get into a whole new mindset because you're now, when you, when, when you as the creator have to have that relationship directly with your audience, you have to think of what it is you're making and why you're making it and who you're making it for. And who you're making it for almost becomes the first question you ask yourself before you actually can sit down and write something. Mm. And I'm sure, you know, and it's those skills as the business changes, it's those skills that filmmakers who are making maybe a traditional feature film, also need to start asking themselves, but haven't been really had to. And of course, it would make people like Oliver's job much easier if, if filmmakers had thought about who's going to be watching the film before they've actually written the script. Mm. I'm curious, though, because you, you talk there about this notion of the filmmaker needing to have a direct relationship with the audience. And Oliver, from your perspective, do you find that the filmmakers that you're working with aren't necessarily interested in having that direct relationship or, or perhaps are kind of a little bit sheltered from that type of relationship directly with the audience? I haven't I haven't necessarily found that. I mean, a lot of the directors, you know, the, certainly the sort of emerging or younger, you know, whatever you want to term them, but, you know, directors who are out there and who are trying to get maybe their first or second feature made, uh, I feel very acutely aware of of, uh, the need to connect their material with an audience. I mean, sometimes, you know, you do have to be the voice saying, you know, well, you know, I understand what you're trying to do here, but, you know, uh, at some point a distributor's got to try and sell this and they've got to you know, they've got to connect it with an audience. So let's figure out exactly who that is. Mm. So I suppose it's not quite as immediate, which is um, what Ellis is saying. But I think increasingly they are. And actually, interestingly, it was just, uh, it was Fright Fest last weekend, a uh, horror-specific film festival in London uh, every year over the weekend. It's sponsored by Film 4. And it's got a very loyal following, um, a very discerning uh, and, you know, warm-hearted fans. And... You know, that's a that's an opportunity where directors, you know, get to show their their material to an audience and then have direct contact with them in, you know, question and answer sessions and that kind of thing. And actually it feels a little bit in this this you know, the modern digital age that ironically that direct connection with an audience is very, very important. Mm. Um and it's a little bit like, you know, musicians have found that, you know, the money isn't necessarily coming through and record sales that comes in in touring Mm. well it's not i mean it's not quite the same but you know there is i think actually more pressure on uh film directors even writers actors all those people to have direct contact uh with people whether it be at events on twitter you know facebook all those kinds of things are increasingly important in Mm. the promotion of of, of material which brings me back to what NSI was saying about having that relationship and, and kind of being present at things like MCM's Comic Con in London uh, as part of the VidFest uh, event. Now, NSI, perhaps you'd like to explain to our audience exactly what VidFest is, because it is quite an interesting observation in terms of, of how VidFest has, has kind of grown to become such a large part of Comic Con. Yeah, I mean, obviously, MCM London Comic Con has been running for, for for many years now, and has grown and is now out in many other cities. Uh, and the VidFest part of it really sort of almost came by accident, because it was um, it was a handful of YouTubers wanting to be at MCM themselves, because they wanted to, they wanted to be able to meet their fans sell merchandise to their fans uh, and just have that meet and greet opportunity which 
hadn't really st- started happening in the UK for YouTuber YouTubers. And so it was just a handful, but but it was became quite increasingly obvious to MCM that the crowds that would gather around the YouTubers were very, very hungry for the, you know, to be able to meet those people, uh, you know, the, the fans of them. And so VidFest ended up becoming, it's having its area within MCM, but also having its own identity, Vid, 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 VidFest UK being that identity. I mean, some fans are now, you know, they go to MCM, but they're actually saying, that, you know, they're going there because of VidFest, because, mm. you know, uh, it's something that really only the last 12 months the British press started realising is that some of our, our British YouTubers were actually bigger than a lot of rock stars and pop stars, mm. because those those fans out there, they're not just fans, they are passionate, ambassadorial, advocate, advocating fans. Mm. And and so I suppose it's interesting to understand that we have these these concentrated pockets, if you like, of activity and opportunity for creators to connect directly to their audiences. But do you think that there is perhaps still a, a certain disconnect between the creators and the audience? And as much as, Oliver, from your perspective, I, I think that there's still probably very much a closed-door policy. It's not a very transparent kind of process for fans to be kind of aware of what's going on during production or or post-production even for that matter. It's still very much a case of, you know, here's the, here's the final product and, and we're going to take this to the cinema and, and you're going to enjoy it in the cinema versus necessarily taking that audience on the journey with the, the, the actual production itself. What's your view on that? As, as, as far as my understanding of, you know, filmmaking goes, especially something with any kind of, you know, budget and uh, distributors and uh, already on board, pre-sold, that kind of thing. You have a you have a kind of licensing issue that, uh, you know, what a film is from business perspective is uh, a piece of I. IP that is to be exploited within the marketplace and I think a lot of investors um, and distributors and sales agents and not to mention producers, actors, directors would be concerned if that intellectual property wasn't being efficiently exploited mm-hmm. and that's you know and that, that terminology makes it sound like a kind of cigar chomping maniacal kind of producer thing to say I don't mean it like that but I, yeah. I mean you know but Filmmaking tends, you know, it's, it's very, very long. <laughs> it's very, very risky. Mm. <laughs> and, um, you know, there's lots and lots of points at which, you know, things go really, really wrong. And then you patch them up and pretend like it didn't happen mm. and present a nice, hopefully, sparkly, tied up in a bow film at the end. I think sometimes people are doing a few things to try and involve their audiences earlier. Mm-hmm. Um, it's difficult because of course, you know, even, even say just imagery from the film, you know, that is, that is closely protected. You know, you can't, you can't publish images of your leading actors without their permission because that's their own, uh, rights over their own image and, and the use of that. Um, I know far from the Madding crowd, for example, the UK film that came out, uh, earlier in the year they had a twitter account during production Mm -hmm. um where they were tweeting pictures and things from the set and and that that was quite a lot of fun but of course it's limited because they can't they can't show the set itself Mm -hmm. they have to show everything around the set and it's partly a question of of ownership you know uh who owns the film well actually it's it's quite a lot of people and quite a lot of organizations and it you know varies from territory to territory Mm -hmm. and unless someone has worldwide rights which tends to only be studios who can do that Mm -hmm. it's quite difficult for in the independent sector for you to really do that much uh, to involve an audience in the real stuff going on i think if you're doing a very very low budget feature Mm -hmm. um, that was crowdsourced you know crowdfunding sourced and uh, all that kind of thing, and maybe you were going to go straight for digital distribution, and maybe you wanted to, you know, maybe you wanted to just do a, a deal with, uh, you know, say, say your dream was to do a deal with, with Netflix. It, it may be that in involving people all the way through your production process and post process and that kind of thing, it, say you built up half a million Twitter followers then that would be of use, but it would still be a risk Mm. because you'd be showing so much of what you're doing before it's really ready to be shown. 
it's a bit like you know if you're making a piano mm -hmm. and uh you showed it to someone when all well, you've got is the blueprint and then maybe you've got the the legs but nothing attached to them you know mm -hmm. and it's mm -hmm. you know it's it's quite it's quite tricky you want to just show them a you know beautiful grand piano <laughs> <laughs> Interesting analogy. But I'm curious, Alyssa, from your perspective, because one of the points that, that Oliver makes there is that um, it may be easier if you're looking to distribute your content, say, for example, with Netflix or, or you know, in some digital way, that it may make it easier to then be able to have that conversation with the audience. Do you think that there is, is a significant difference for digital content creators in the way that they can communicate to the audience? Um. No, I mean it's 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 essential. I mean, if you're making something specifically for the for online, then it's essential that you do start that relationship with the audience as early as possible. There's no, there's almost no reason not to, mm. because the end result is going to be online, and so you want to have built up that network of supporters through Twitter, Facebook, crowdfunding, whichever way you're doing it. Mm. You know, prior to the release of that of that first episode, if, if that's if that's what it is. Do you, do you feel that there is any concern there in terms of the protection of the IP or, or the, the kind of the saleability of that IP in, in the way that Oliver was speaking about? Well, not if you've planned it planned it out. If you're if you're if 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 you've set up on a mission that is what you're going to do, then you would you would be working, and you would have worked out what that strategy is, what you plan to release, you know how you can release it, and what permissions you 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 need ahead of time to do that. Mm. The the you know, the only question mark is is because you know we're all very time sensitive as to how much time we can put into things and oh. especially if we're producing stuff it's also very hard to become your own personal marketeer uh -huh. to your own productions and that's always the the trickiest part of it is actually how much time can you spend audience building when actually you're actually supposed to go out there and make something mm. and and I think that's well, you know, it's very easy to fall down because you can have the best intentions, but actually to put a, a, an actual strategy in place for, for marketing when you're, a, you know, you're a team of two or three people can be very difficult, and very challenging. Do you see that as a, as a required role within a, you know, the, the, the crew on, on a, you know, a digital content piece is, is to have somebody who is social media or social marketing focused? I think for a, for a, for a, certainly for a digital production, for 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 um, a web release, you, if you haven't got it, then you need to have had advice from someone who understands it, um, be, or people who have gone through the process and actually can can tell you the pitfalls, because it's you know every, everyone can go into it with the best intentions. Oh, I'll tweet this and I'll tweet that on Instagram on a daily basis, and I'll have you know a special Snapchat. But, you know, that's you, you could be on five or six different platforms. Uh, but once you've started it, you know, can you keep it up? Because you have to keep it up. Mm. You know, it's no good putting in a couple of pictures and then forgetting about it. Which brings me to the other end of the spectrum, which when we're talking about the kind of more traditional production processes, I'm interested to, to know from your perspective, Oliver, whether or not there is kind of a, a social media crisis plan. Um, should an actor or director or producer or whoever release too much information on their you know, Twitter account or their Instagram or whatever it is, do, do you tend to think about those things in advance? Or are you prepared? Should somebody do something like that? Um, well, <laughs> with all it's, it's this sort of old adage of, of, of producing really is that you know you can't worry about things until they happen so you know we don't have an internal process for that but of course it would also be connected to whoever owned the licensing for the film in various territories so for example if something happened on our current project it would be you know be Pathé I'm sure and their marketing team yes. uh, who are on top of this and I mean it's worth saying that if you know some somewhere like Pathé, you know their their marketing team is very tech savvy and online and pushing films through social media and and that kind of thing. Mm. And I, but I think they you know it doesn't happen on every film. But I think that's a that's a judgment that they've made. You know it's it's not a kind of laziness thing. It's that you know to get any kind of notice online you have to make a lot a lot of noise mm. and if you're not confident that that's the best way to connect to your audience 
then there's 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 not always the best argument to do it. Mm. That said, there's usually something for every film, mm -hmm. and every project. You know, Sweet Porn says there's a Facebook group, there's a um, Twitter account uh, set up by E1, the distributor in the UK that was pushing it, and, and you know, other distributors uh, around the world did the same. Mm -hmm. um, so, so you know, but I think, you know, actors, are, you know, for example, or directors, you know, they're very professional and they know, mm -hmm. you know, they tend to know what they're doing and, and the, the impact that anything they say would have. Mm. So that, you know, it, it tends to be relatively controlled. I haven't heard of anything like that happening. Is Josh Trank ring any bells? Oh, uh, well, yeah. Okay. <laughs> I mean, it does happen. And I mean, but it tends to be when people, when people don't like something, mm. isn't it? Mm. So it tends to be after something's come out, then someone goes, oh, I, I would like to distance myself from this film. Mm. Um, and, uh, you know, and often it, it's, it's after something's come out mm. and uh, been responded to badly, then they kind of distance themselves from it. And I've always seen that's a little bit uh, reactive, you know. Mm. I mean, mm. if you feel that way, presumably you felt that way for a while. Mm. This is true. So I am curious, though. We're talking about the notion of developing for, for something like Netflix. And obviously it's very interesting that Netflix aren't going to be renewing one of their deals that allows them to uh, maintain some of those, what some people might consider as kind of mainstream titles, and that they're going to be focusing on their own slates. And and so I, th I think this brings the focus back again to the idea that there are these streaming platforms that also want to not just own the platform, but own the content as well. And I wonder from your perspective, Alisar, whether or not you think that this is kind of opening the door for these digital content creators to, to really be able to have more focus on the way that they should be pitching and developing that content. Uh, no, I, I do eventually, if that's, if that's the career path that people want to go. I think, you know, it, it's... Um... If you're making series for online consumption, whether you're putting that on YouTube or something, you, you're still learning about producing uh, uh, episodic series, you know, episodes having a beginning, middle, and end, but an entire series also having a beginning, middle, and end. Mm -hmm. I think what you find, what I find really interesting about web series and who are making it is that you actually, whereas indie film has always been very much a director-led business making online web series has all been about you know the writer the creator mm. and them becoming also the producer and uh, and effectively you know the showrunner of their series uh, and it's quite an important skill to have because it's not something that's necessarily happened in the UK as far as broadcast TV until recently last few years and there's mm. certainly a lot of writers who are working in television who've never had that experience. And if they were picked up with that American style of series production, and it's like, you're the writer, now you're also going to be the producer of this, a lot of those writers in this country wouldn't know where to start as far as producing. It's interesting that you bring this up because I, I do think that there is a, a generalistic trend at the moment of aspiring directors who understand and, and take a, a first step that they assume needs to happen in the form of a short film. So we've seen some great short film content or, or kind of indie film content that that gets them the conversation with people in you know Hollywood or the bigger studios. Um but they don't necessarily have the experience with a web series so much as the experience of just putting together a short. And, you know, I, I list people like Gareth Edwards or, or some of the smaller indie filmmakers here in, in the UK who've gone ahead and done great films like Project Kronos, for example, and then gone on to, to be able to have those conversations as a result of that, that piece of, uh, you know, short film. We're seeing a lot of that kind of thing happen at the moment. But those people aren't necessarily getting the kind of experience that you're talking about, LSR, in terms of actually running a, a web series and producing a web series. Sure, they're getting to write one short piece of content, but not necessarily a series. Do you think it is something they should be investing time in? Film, television, shorts, web series, whatever. It's all production at the end of the day. Right. But, you know, it's not, it's not, it's not, you know, it's not rocket science to see that the trend towards TV series uh, is is sort of taking almost taking that spot that independent film was. You know, mm -hmm. you know, it's, you know, the Netflix, the Amazons, and all these other platforms that are popping up. They all want to commission series mm -hmm. because they want 
they want, you know, they want 13 hours for, you know, 20 hours to, to commission in one go rather than 90, 90 minutes. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's, more, it's, pretty, it, it's more value to them to have series. Mm-hmm. I think you can make a very good short and it can win awards and it's beautiful and everyone loves it, but you don't have to tell a story in that short film. Mm-hmm. And if you, if, if you do want to work for a Netflix, then you have to be able to tell a story and mm-hmm. over, over several episodes. Uh, and if you've never made a web series or any kind of series before, then a web series is a good way to, to learn and experiment. Mm-hmm. Because, you know, if, if a short film is an experiment for, a, for making feature films, then, you know, then a web series can be an experiment for making a television series. Okay. I'm going to I'm going to deviate slightly from the usual questions that I would kind of ask about the future of your industries because I know you've both answered those questions at one point or another from me. So, I'm going to change it up this time and ask you if you were to give one single year piece of advice to somebody who's listening to this show right now and thinking about doing something, whether that's a short film, whether it's a feature, whether it's digital content or not, what would be that piece of advice that you would give to them? Oliver, let's start with you. It's difficult because it's it's such a broad uh, audience you're defining mm. for that advice. I think I think one of the one of the best pieces um, of advice I I would say is to know what's going on now. So you do have to consume vast quantities of film and television media um, in the now, but also to know your history. Mm. You know, if you're if you're making a horror movie. Uh, for example, or a horror short, or you're thinking of starting doing horror things, then, you know, if you haven't seen The Omen and Rosemary's Baby and The Shining and those sorts of things, you've got to go, you've got to go and watch those. And all the way back, you know, go mm-hmm. to the Murnau Nosferatu silent German expressionist movie, you know. Mm-hmm. So I think knowing your canon is, mm-hmm. is, is a very, very useful thing because you also can see from that how you know that that kind of monomyth stuff beginning to come through you see that okay you know there was the golden era of hollywood you know uh in the 30s and then there was another one in the 70s and there was the golden age of television now or in uh you know but you begin to see the pattern of how stories work what kind of characters they are how those refer to the times in which they're made Mm -hmm. and that will better inform the nature of the content that you're producing for now Mm. you know a lot of stuff made in the past was to do with the cold war for example Mm -hmm. well what what are the kinds of things that people are fearful of today you Mm -hmm. know the the landscape has changed Mm -hmm. um what are the things people are interested in today uh what do people love about today what do people value today Mm -hmm. um and you've got to kind of but you've got to kind of go on that exploratory Mission. So I suppose watch lots of movies and TV. <laughs> it's my, it's, my it's a hard job, but somebody's going to do it. <laughs> yeah, it's, 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 it's awful, yeah. And what about you, Alisa? What would you recommend? I mean, I would agree with all that. You, you, absolutely. You should, you, should, you should, if you want to be in business, you should be watching what the business is currently producing. But I, I, I certainly, if, if someone is maybe thinking about making a short film, I would, I would probably suggest, you know what, think about making a web series instead. Um, you'd probably make it, end up making it for the same amount of money, but you'd learn a lot more, I think, as far as releasing it, audience development, audience building. And I think, I, I think it can open more doors as well. Yeah. It's, it, it's actually quite surprising how, how having made a web series without any representation, you know, people are actually having meetings with broadcasters because of they've, they've actually made something Mm -hmm. and and people can watch it. Mm -hmm. And that, and you know, you can send in an idea to, to a broadcaster on paper and it might take them several weeks or months to get around to it. But if you send an email with a link to episode one of your web series, chances are they'll probably watch it within 24 hours. Mm. Okay. That's some excellent advice from both of you. And I'm going to ask you to let our listeners know how they can best follow you or uh, be uh, aware of what it is you're up to in the world, possibly with your Twitter handle as a starting point, Oliver. 
My uh, Twitter handle is just uh, at Oliver Kasman. Um, Wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> and Alisa, what about you? Uh, my Twitter handle is at Ellie Cab, E L I C A B. Wonderful. Very short and sweet. Okay. And just because I'm aware, certainly in Elisar's case, you might have something you wish to promote at the moment. Any particular web series that you would recommend people go have a look at? Well, there's my own one, Threesome, which is at uh, threesome.tv with a number three, S-O-M-E, dot TV. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's won awards now around the world, and it's certainly opened many doors. As, and it's um, So it's, uh, I think it's a good example of... of of uh, a good concise writing okay. and then um uh, later short film super mum is at rain dance festival um later this month mm-hmm. and then on september the 28th on dvd i have a release of a uh, feature film i produced called deadly virtues wonderful thank you and uh, oliver is there anything particular that you have at the moment that you're trying to uh, get people to watch well actually i did um I did a tiny, tiny short film uh, with the first time. A direct, I had, uh, here you go, I had £1,500, a <laughs> one-day shoot, and a director who'd never been on a film set before. <laughs> and, not too uh, many challenges in one go, then. <laughs> not too many challenges, uh, and we made, and to make matters worse, it was set in 19th century California. Wow. It's a Western, and <laughs> it was filmed in a Redwood Grove in Surrey. So yeah. if you if you go to my um, Twitter page, I'll actually, I'll, I'll just tweet about it again now. Mm-hmm. Um, but it's called El Fuego, and it's on Vimeo. And would love some feedback on it. It's, I think, for you know, I think uh, director did a cracking job, mm-hmm. and it's uh, we're all really proud of it. Okay, well, we will include links to all of these shows in the show notes. But thank you very much, chaps, for joining us today, and thank you for listening. If you enjoy this content and you want to hear more, then do remember to subscribe and review. And thanks again for joining us today. DigitalJamSessions.com.